morning, everyone. Um, Lisa, is that all displaying correctly? Yep, that's good. Perfect. Um, thank you, everyone, for your time this morning, and, and thank you to Lisa and colleagues for the invitation. I am going to give a talk, not just on biological fertilizers, um, though I will give a good overview of the project that Lisa mentioned, um, but I also want to touch on conventional fertilizers and 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 their perhaps slightly misunderstood role in um, contributing to soil health outcomes. Um, so first of all, I'd um, like to acknowledge um, funders and collaborators for most of this work, um, particularly with GRDC, um, and my colleagues Lynn McDonald, Mike Wong, and Mike Webb at CSIRO, um, Sasha Jenkins and Lynn Abbott from the University of Western Australia, and then the Rose Gallery of Technicians at the bottom, Tom Carter, Janine McGowan, and Steve Zarvis, uh, without whom there probably wouldn't be any data in this presentation to show you. So I'm going to give a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, first of all, I do want to talk about um, the alternative amendments and that GRDC project that's funded a couple of years ago now. Um, and these include organic amendments such as composts and manures, biochars, biostimulants, microbials and alternative fertilisers. I'm going to be looking at them through the lens of constraints and, and trying to think about what is it that is actually the limiting factor to production. What is it you're trying to overcome and why might it be that you want to look at applying some of these more alternative amendments. And in the context of that, um, I'm going to touch at the end on the importance of nutrient balance. Um, I hate to state the obvious here, but if you're taking out more than you return, well, that's what Rio Tinto and BHP make a business out of. And it's probably not so good for long-term sustainability of farming. And that's why I will focus a fair chunk of this talk actually on conventional fertilizers also. So biologicals. Um, lots of different amendment types, um, as discussed. You've got the organic amendments, um, very well studied in most cases, perhaps not in a system specific sense, but certainly a class of amendments that is very well understood in terms of um, their stability, nutrient content, and what they offer. Biochars obviously had a huge flurry of research um, around 10 years ago, and that's still ongoing, perhaps in a little bit more of a um, pragmatic way now, and looking at how they can be combined with other um, amendments and additives. Um, I won't be focusing too much on them in this talk. Alternative fertilizers, um, so maybe slow release or, or with very specific um, micronutrient balances or biological base, so things like struvites. Biostimulants, um, there's a whole range of products available in this category. Um, they are based around a few different things. A key thing here is that they're not fertilizers. Indeed, they're defined as having next to no nutrient content themselves. The idea is that they stimulate plants with better at capturing nutrients from the soil. And then finally, you have microbials, which might be applied either to the soil, well, I say either, sorry, to the soil, to the seed. Obviously, um, one that we know very well, of course, is rhizobia for legumes. Um, I don't put that in this category as to all the other alternative amendments because ultimately, like um, rhizobia, are very well proven in legumes. Um, so that's not within scope of what I'm talking about. Um, but there are also fungal inoculants as well. And the thing I want to think about here is yeah, the first thing that problem that we came across when we did this project was ultimately we had, I think it was 30 or 40 that we tried in the field at various points. We had a library of well over 100. And in reality, we only scratched the surface. And in the three years that that project ran, more products came on the market. Some of the ones that we were testing um, ceased to be available for purchase. So it's a very dynamic system. And I think focusing on individual products is quite a difficult task, particularly for a researcher. So instead, what we proposed was instead was to look carefully at what the modes of action might be for each of these. So some of them have direct nutrient value, obviously alternative fertilizers, that's their main selling point. Um, 
organic amendments to a large extent also. Some of them operate on plant phys physiological mechanisms, some on soil biological mechanisms, some on soil chemical mechanisms, and then some on soil physical mechanisms. And it's safe to say that most of them would operate on some of those mechanisms to some extent. And here's just an infographic I grabbed from a journal article a couple of years ago that, that shows some of the different areas where, where some of these amendments might have an effect. So you've got disease resistance perhaps in the plant itself, um, improving root structure um, and potential nodulation, um, improving um, fruiting responses and things like that in, in crops where that's appropriate. So I'm now going to go through the next couple of slides that really try and show what I mean by this um, physiological mechanism, the, by these mechanisms and, and sort of the, the scale you might expect for each of the amendment type and the length of time. So on the bottom axis, the x-axis, um, you've got the six different amendment types there. And on the y-axis, the vertical axis, what we try to do is give a pictorial assessment of the duration of effect. So given the fact that this example slide is plant physiological mechanisms and these slides were put together in the context of grain growing rather than, um, rather than livestock, clearly no amendment could have a physiological plant physiological mechanism um, that lasts longer than the life of the plant, which is less than a year, which is why they all stop at that one year point. But you'll see that biostimulants in particular and microbials as they get going would expect to have the larger impact in that space. When it gets to soil biological mechanisms though, um, whilst we feel that altering those is a long and difficult game, um, given that there are billions and billions of microbes already quite happy in the soil and quite content there, introducing a novel type of microbe is, can be quite difficult to get it established. So here what we're trying to reflect in some regard is the fact that some of these longer-lived longer um, amendments, particularly biochars that weather over time, actually can start having a longer term effect as time goes on. But you'll see by the width of the bars that it is still quite a subtle effect. Soil chemical mechanisms, um, by definition, we would expect biostimulants have no effect and microbials very little. And you'll see again over time, those chemical mechanisms um, do last longer than a growth cycle. And for biochars, which we know are incredibly stable and can last in the soils for decades to hundreds of years, um, you'll see quite clearly that we wouldn't, that we'd expect them to carry on contributing to some extent in the longer term. And that's not in a nutrient capacity per se, but that's more the, the sort of, I guess, clay-like properties that some biochars can have, particularly over time as they weather, um, building that buffering capacity and cation exchange capacity. So I'm going to have a bit of a summary of, of where I got to, of where that sort of background from our three or four years of research in that space um, came about. As I said, there are a highly diverse range of products, but they are mechanistically categorizable. Um, if you think carefully about what the modes of action that they have, you can start thinking about what, um, what mechanism they would be using to effect the response that they're marketed to do so, and then start considering them in a bit more of a pragmatic manner. Um, clearly biostimulants, particularly those that are applied at a folia, um, are single season. But you would expect a legacy effect of organic amendments, particularly things like biochars. And what we're able to do is produce a, a sort of heat map chart here that provides a, a perhaps a, a, a suggestive indication as to what sorts of soil, soil or production constraints the different types of amendments might be able to address. And this is available in a um, in not just the final report um, that we produce for the GRDC, um, but there is also a plain English review that was produced from that project, and I'm happy to provide um, that to Lisa for distribution at the end. So carrying on with the overview of the project, so that was the, the sort of background and the literature review and the, and the sort of and talking and experience that we gained over those three or four years of that project. I'm not going to give a bit of an overview of, of what experimental work we actually conducted during that project. As I mentioned at the start, we did have a, a remit to focus on breadth rather than depth. Um, the aim of the project was very much 
a snapshot view as to what was available at the time rather than a comprehensive understanding of a few amendments. Uh, we looked at over 60 products in detail, although trust me, we've got more than double that in, in um, cupboards in the lab. Um, some of them are still smelling quite nicely. Um, looked at laboratory characterization. I'm not going to focus on too much here, but did some glasshouse work and we also did some field experimentation. In those field experiments, there were a total of 38 products tested. We also did some mechanistic work um, for sort of best bet approaches, but this was very much in the final year of the project. Um, we were particularly interested in whether or not, given so many biostimulants in particular, talk about their ability to improve nitrogen capture from organic matter. We thought the most practical application to that would be trying to get the best um, best out of a previous legume crop. So, we're, uh, so we used a nice topic labeled approach to look at the capture of nitrogen from that legume litter in a following wheat crop. So locations of the field sites, there were eight in total, um, two New South Wales, Parks and Rankin Springs, in Valley, as Lisa mentioned, Baskerville Freeling, which unfortunately was subject to the Pinery fires and we never got any data out of it, and Langhorne Creek in South Australia, Buntine over in WA and Mount Tyson on the Darling Downs. Um, so we covered quite a range of, um, of areas with these. Um, I'll confess to having a bit of a South Australian centric um, angle to it, but I guess that's what always happens when the key researchers are based nearby. Um, it's much easier to drive to Lancon Creek than it is to get to Bunting. Um, so field data. Um, what I'm going to present here is field data from the second year of the experiment. So these trials all went for two years and they had the same nutrient, the same fertilizer or um, or, or biological amendment applied successively in the following year. So each plot by this point has had two years worth of amendment. All the amendments were applied with a 50% district practice fertilizer underneath them, the view being that they were there to augment and maybe offset some fertilizer rather than replace it. Um, and yields at 100% fertilizer, because we had a fertilizer response rate trial um, incorporated in incorporated into these projects, so these experiments, so we were able to see what, what we would have got just by adding more fertilizer, um, trying to see whether or not we were seeing something above and beyond that. Those rates in this year range, range from 2.3 tonnes per hectare at Bunting uh, to a very impressive 7.6 tonnes per hectare in Valley. Um, you'll know the season, um, that was the very wet one um, when South Australia's electricity blew away. Um, some of these we had, we did yield profit calculations via APSIM, and we actually found we were returning um, yields above the theoretical water limited capacity. So, so it was about as good as a year as you could get unless the crop was absolutely waterlogged um, at most of these sites. Um, and this figure that I'm going to build and walk through in front of you, because we had the eight different field sites, what I've done here is normalize things to a response ratio. So if you see no bar, i.e. zero, that is returning exactly the same yield as the 100% district practice fertilizer treatment did. And you'll see there that that is indeed the 100% district practice and they're all pretty much on the line and those error bars should really extend both above and below the line and apologies for that. Um, the alternate fertilizers, um, interestingly, none of them really managed to produce above that dotted line and indeed a couple a couple of those sites were below that line so that's suggesting that some of these alternate fertilizers even though they were nutrient matched to the conventional urea etc that they replaced um, didn't actually provide quite as a um, quite as much kick in that single year i oh, sorry across those two years biochars really had no measurable effect biostimulants again mostly tending towards negative rather than positive, but you do have to bear in mind here that, that we had a 50% reduction in fertilizer applied underneath these, so it may just be that they're not managing to account for that um, and maybe should be applied on top of 100% rather than 50% to augment it rather than to replace it. Humates again, um, similar story. Microbials, and indeed the only amendments that we really saw a big leap in production 
um, was one poultry manure. Um, so those two really high points there, sorry, are um, they're a single poultry manure applied at both Parks and Rankin Springs in New South Wales. That same poultry manure was applied at those sites in the previous season and we didn't get that response. We've done about as comprehensive a chemical analysis as you could possibly do. Um, it's not an obvious micronutrient or even a macronutrient addition over and above the fertilizer or indeed the other organic amendments that were applied at that trial. So it's a bit of a puzzle. Um, but I think the thing to take from here is that, that at least in the short term of two rotations, with, with the exception of those possibly unexplainable poultry litters, we're really not seeing um, some of these big increases that you sort of see visually in some of the materials that are available about these products. You know, you'll see strips where you have one crop nearly falling over and another one bright green. Uh, we did not see anything like that in this ex in this experiment across any of the sites, with the exception of that one poultry manure at the two locations. So moving to nitrogen uptake, the pot experiment that we did in the glass house. Um, we used 10 biostimulants and humates, and the reason we focused on these was that these were products that was had specific comment in their product information about their ability to improve capture of nitrogen from soil organic matter. We added labelled medic litter, um, could have chosen another legume, to be honest, this was what we already had labelled and available to us, so we chose to use it. Um, and what this does is it allows us to look at where the nitrogen has actually come from. So rather than saying it's come from just the soil, we can say specifically whether or not it had got it from the soil or this freshly ad added medic litter, which might be, although medic probably not, probably be a grain pulse, but you would expect a, a legume as part of a rotation, um, a grower would be targeting maximum capture of that nitrogen. So we looked at nitrogen availability over time in the experiment, and there wasn't really that much going on there. Um, the no litter control had um, higher, a higher peak than the others. Nothing really to write home about much. Then we looked at nitrogen uptake at the end, and, and what we found at the end was ultimately compared to the Zero control, so this was just with the medic litter and no amendment, so no liquid or solid biostimulant amendment. We didn't find any treatment that exceeded it. And in actual fact, two of the liquids reduced the amount of total end capture by those wheat plants, which is um, not really what was supposed to happen. Um, but again, it fits in with what we showed in the field, that in actual fact, there's, we're really struggling when we look at these in truly replicated, randomised experiments to see some of the results that, that perhaps are out there, particularly on social media from time to time. And I just, I just urge a bit of caution here as to really you need to understand how it's going to behave in your system. So a summary of findings from this, from the experimental part of that GRDC project. Um, there was a large variability in chemistry. Um, but when thinking about it pragmatically and taking literature into consideration, um, it is possible to predict the modes of action that these products might be imparting. We did see in our experimental work very limited effect on grain yield, and the mechanistic study indicated that we could find no positive effect of biostimulants on wheat nitrogen capture. Um, so a little disappointing, um, but perhaps also not too surprising. So I'm going to go back to the soil constraints conversation again. And I'm going to channel my inner James Hunt here at this point. Um, the largest single driver, single failure to meet was limited yield potential in grains in dryland Australian agriculture is a lack of available nitrogen. That's an average statement across the whole of the wheat belt. It is not the case in some cases where you have specific soil constraints and as per the biologicals, you really need to understand what those constraints are to address them. But it does ask the question, can we apply more nitrogen? Um, and we need to understand what the risks are, whether or not there are environmental concerns, and um, particularly in higher rainfall areas, and whether or not there's an impact on the bottom line. 
And using James's graph here from his notion bank work up at Cuyo, um, here at Chuka, um, his treatments tend to indicate that he's most profitable across two years, and I've now seen data for four years from the same experiment, and it still looks more or less the same. They are both in positive end balance, so more nitrogen is being added than is lost, than is being exported from the system, um, so that's on the x-axis. And gross margin um, is around the highest as well with some of those treatments. So a more liberal fertilizer approach, if applied appropriately, does seem to have some promise, at least in that experiment. And James is, is very clear that, that this is something that does need testing wider. So in John Kierkegaard's work, um, but Greenthorpe and other places um, heading north also tend towards the same conclusion. And why do I want to talk about this? Well, ultimately, um, ever since cropping systems at least moved away from having long lays, um, there hasn't been anywhere near as much input of organic matter um, back into the system. And organic matter is basically a slow release fertilizer. Fertilizers are increasingly applications, increasingly targeted at crop demand in that season to that forecast rainfall. And yet we still know that nutrient use efficiency is typically around less than 50%. So the rest of the nitrogen in a given crop is coming from the soil, primarily soil organic matter. And if you carry on doing, taking out more than you put in, eventually end up in a situation where more and more of the fertilizer has to come, more and more of the nitrogen has to come from the fertilizer. And if we're struggling to get above 50% coming from the fertilizer, no matter what the situation, um, you end up in a point where you might well be declining. So can increasing fertilizer rates make up the difference if we run down our organic matter? Um, not really. You're really looking at a situation where if you have higher organic matter, you're on a different trajectory um, for crop response. And that's down to just how well matched organic matter release of nitrogen is to crop production. Why I'm talking about this and the evidence for these statements that we're in, that nitrogen is something that perhaps needs thinking about from an environmental perspective, but not the way you would think, um, and indeed might need to be applying a bit more in certainly quite a large amount of, of um, grains regions and possibly others. Um, the nutrient balance thing would still hold. This is data from Rob Norton's study commissioned by GRDC a few years ago. Studied 125 southeastern Australian farms and found in almost all cases there was a net removal of nitrogen. So more nitrogen is being taken out um, in grain at harvest that was being applied as fertilizer. And this, but you've got to bear in mind here that we've not even accounted for all potential losses of nitrogen um, with this study either. So it's painting a fairly negative picture where we're being very conservative in nitrogen, possibly for apparently the right reasons, but in actual fact it's driving the systems backwards. Now doing that in some seasons is fine. Um, you definitely want to be exploiting as much nitrogen as possible after a legume, for instance. Um, but I think you need to think about this in the same way as a, as a bank account. That's fine to go into debt, provided you understand what you're taking on and what you're building your business with. Um, but just willy-nilly going into your overdraft without knowing how much is in there is going to lead to a big problem. And the same goes for how we're managing nitrogen. So moving on a little bit into a space of where carbon and nitrogen interact and get into the solar health aspect of where I want to talk about today, and I'm aware I need to be tight on time. I just want to look here at where the inputs and outputs come from the system. Um, carbon, unless you're applying organic amendments, the only way you're getting carbon back into the system is by getting the plant to put it there. Nitrogen, obviously, fertilizer is a major place where it comes from, um, but you also have um, end fixation, deposition, as well as those organic amendments. Your exports of carbon, on the other hand, um, are microbial activity primarily, respiration, um, but also erosion and export in the crop. Nitrogen export in the crop is the biggest ex biggest loss in inverted commas of nitrogen from the system. So really, if you want to build carbon, you need to build plant inputs. And I'm aware that um, Susan will probably do a much more comprehensive um, job on this topic than I intend to do today. The reason I'm building this here, though, is because I want to get into the idea that we can actually have an estimate of how much carbon you're putting into a system, if you understand a few different things. And I don't want to go through the equations here, but I want to look at what's in this table. And if you understand what your harvest index is, or in, or in grey, or in um, pasture, um, you probably skip that bit and just go straight to the rich shoot ratio. You have a rough idea of the percent of carbon in 
your biomass. We can have a fiddle with these retention factors. These are numbers that Lynn McDonald and I picked from best guesses from the literature. We actually have a postdoc working on these to try and refine these a bit more. They would vary on the basis of soil type and probably crop type also, but they're basically how much of the carbon you might expect to retain in the system. We then look at root exudates, which you may have heard mentioned in some conversations before. So this is basically label carbon that comes out of the roots as they're growing. It can be a larger amount than most people give it credit for. Um, I would also say it's a much smaller amount than some other people give it credit for. Um, but nonetheless, um, it is a significant proportion of carbon that is added to a system. And because it is so easily used by microbes, it actually has a higher retention factor because it requires much less energy for microbes to turn into microbial biomass. But if we understand some of these things, and some of these can be um, almost finger in the air, back of the envelope things, just allow you to constrain the system as to how much carbon you could be having. And this figure here basically shows the relationship using those figures between a change in yield or a change in dry biomass. So that's the delta above ground biomass in tons per hectare on the bottom and a potential change in soil organic carbon. So you'll see if you're increasing around 1.2 tons per hectare of above, above ground biomass yield, you might be increasing your carbon by about three hundred kilos per hectare per year. Big emphasis on the might here. This is purely as a theoretical calculator at this stage rather than really telling you what will happen. But it exists for the purpose of really trying to be able to put a handle on how much carbon you might be adding to the system. So we know how much nitrogen we're adding to a system, but it is very hard to understand how much carbon might be being added to a system. The reason I wanted to bring it into this conversation is because on the second y-axis I've just put up. Organic matter is more than just carbon, it is also nitrogen. So you need to learn, this goes back to what I was saying about needing to understand that nitrogen might be a bigger constraint than you think to production in some cases. If you're wanting to build carbon, you need to be um, prepared to be sinking in substantial amounts of nitrogen to build that. Now there is some ongoing discussion about whether or not mineral fertilizers actually um, increase losses of carbon and nitrogen. I struggle a little bit with that from first principles, provided we're within sensible areas. If, you, if you're applying three, four, five times as much fertilizers as you need, it's probably going to have more detrimental effects than just that. But at the same time, um, if you're applying enough nitrogen that you grow more plant, you should be able to fix more carbon. But I do want to have a go at covering off on some of the potential downsides to using fertilizers to build carbon. I accept that certainly in, in, in um, areas tending towards drought, economically it can be very difficult to justify in the short term. Longer term, unless it's really overdone, however, um, it should have positive effects on soil functions, primarily because you're building the carbon via the plant. You grow more plant, you grow more roots, you're going to build organic matter in the soil over time. There are still substantial questions around N2O emissions and also leaching. Um, you might see a decrease in leaching, um, oddly enough, or nitrous oxide emissions. Because you're actually applying more, more, ca more carbon is coming in from the plants and you're actually having a higher, because you've grown a more proliferous root system, you might actually find that there's greater competition for that nitrogen. But I think a more likely outcome is indeed that you're likely to end up with um, more losses due to microbial activity. And it is potential if you're looking in the carbon sequestration space that you might end up in a similar situation, losing as much as nitrous oxide as you might be gaining from carbon. So there's no, so it's certainly not cut and dry in this space. So to summarize, I'd say alternative inputs may have promise but do require careful selection. Um, our interesting closing remarks for the, that GRDC project were pretty much that if the way for the grains industry to get its head around these amendments, oddly enough is not, I didn't cry out for more research funding. Um, I don't think it's the sort of research that, the sort of problem that researchers could easily answer given how large and dynamic the nature is. What we tried to do as outputs from that project with things like the um, plain English review, we also had a technical guide um, to testing 
to taking approaches to testing biological inputs on the farm is to really look at them in a specific, in a local spe situation specific way preferably in your own paddocks with an eye to how to actually interpret any findings that you might have say out of your monitors or NDVI measurements. Understanding your constraints of production will help guide which sorts of amendments you want to be looking at um, and I still remain convinced that Occam's razor, razor says it's nitrogen in most cases first and foremost. To build carbon you really do need nitrogen and most of the data that we see, particularly that great study of ROBS, is that most grain systems at least appear to be taking more out than they're putting in. And to increase organic matter and thus soil health, um, about the only way in most of these cases is to increase plant inputs and manage and would advise you to manage soil constraints to deal with this. Uh, rather whistle-stop tour, uh, thank you for your attention and happy to take any initial questions and then partake in the discussion. Will's got a question, he's just raising his hand, so go Will. Is that how you raise your hand on the Zoom meeting? I'm not sure. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, Mark, we're, we're not a cropping system here, just a pasture livestock system. When you refer to N, that would be urea in in our language? Yeah, yes, but same, same in cropping. Um, obviously, you get some with um, MAP and DAP, but the main hit of N in most cropping systems is urea. And so that, that uh, application will have an effect on, um, a long-term effect on the nitrogen in the, in the soil as much as what's used in the plant immediately? Yeah, so, so basically, yeah. I mean, ultimately both, both, both you, you, your crop or your grass or your pasture grass and the microbes that live in the soil need nitrogen and they do compete mm -hmm. for it. Most of your organic matter is ultimately recycled plant material that's been through a microbe at least once. Yep. Um, microbes will so for, for very so even in the pasture even in the pasture system. Um, if you look at the C to N ratio of of say some lowland some ryegrass roots yep. versus the organic matter, there's still a lot more carbon in the root, to, so it's a much higher C to N ratio in the root than it is in the soil. Mm -hmm. So the, you're going to be, so as that is decomposed, you're going to lose a lot of the carbon that goes off. There's nothing you can do to avoid that in the most part, yeah. but being nutrient limited exacerbates it. Yeah. So the microbes are really mine. The microbes go from being a carbon limited entity, because of course they can't photosynthesize, they have to get the carbon from the plant, to actually hunting around for the nutrients in that organic matter to survive. And that's when you really see organic matter so in, our, in our system we might apply a, a hundred kilos per hectare a couple of times a year in the autumn and early winter at, yep. at that rate um would you expect to see lift in n in the soil um i can't remember that seems salt is yeah i i can't really answer that in a direct way i don't know if you gathered by I'm presenting mostly on on broad acre Although I try to work across systems, I'm more familiar with exactly. You put in this much, you'll get that much out in grains rather than... It's never that simple, is it? Yeah. Um, the, the, thing, the thing ultimately is to have an understanding as best you can as to how much N you're taking off in, in, your, in your livestock and, and if it's dairy and in milk, obviously, also. Mm -hmm. um, how much is being returned through manure. And obviously in higher input er, in higher rainfall areas, you are going to be looking at some losses also. There'll be rules of thumb for those. It's basically trying to build basically trying to build as, as good a guess of what your budget yep. in both directions is. Yep. And if you're really out of whack one way or the other, you might not see it straight away, but you sure as hell will have a problem in the longer term. Mm -hmm. And that's and I think that's where a lot of the broad acre systems got because of course it's I don't think it's this supposition that we've lost carbon relative to pre-clearing that's certainly the case in some situations but what most of these broad acre systems have definitely done is lost carbon relative to when they were when they had a four or five year lay mm -hmm. phase mm -hmm. to them. yeah um, okay i might i might have to pull it up there but um sure. i suppose the other way that we put in in nitrogen is um through our legumes and then yep. making sure that we've got enough phosphorus there to drive that uh, legume um production 
And I see that Lisa Warren's got a hand up. So I'm I'm wondering whether she was going to talk about <laughs> phosphorus and, and legumes. So I might just um, get uh, Lisa to unmute herself and um, um, fire away, Lisa. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, um, yeah, Mark, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was just wondering what rate of chicken litter, or, or, sorry, you're calling it poultry manure, but I'm presuming it's um, the litter as opposed to... Yes, sorry, yeah. Manure. Um, yeah. Um, do you remember what rates, rates or rate you use? This, this, was a, this was the annoying fudge for that project, given we had so many different amendments coming from so many different places, in the case of the bulk ones, um, not necessarily being able to get them to the lab for analysis first. So talking with all the grow groups we had working with us, we agreed on a set three tonnes per hectare fresh for everything. Yep. So there's issues with moisture content, there's issues with different nutrient content. I do have, I obviously got samples of the product thereafter, which is why I can say that those two that really stood out in terms of crop response did not stand out chemically. Um, i.e. They were, they were just, uh, they were all much of a muchness, actually. Um, I forget exactly how much NMP per kilo okay. can I, within them. Can I just make a, can I just make a comment? Um, I've just I've done quite a bit of um, work comparing inorganics to uh, chicken litter on pastures, like yep. Clarus and subclover. And um, just, yeah, my finding was, uh, I've used humates as well, got no response to humates um, as per your experiment. Yep. Um, but with the chicken litter, I got... Um, exactly the same dry matter response where I put the same um, NPKS amounts in inorganics. So where I matched the NPKS in the inorganics to the chicken litter, I got the same dry matter responses. So that was sort of encouraging that we were just seeing straight out nutrient and we got massive responses to, to N in, in pasture. So um, yeah. and we were using, oh, you know, one and a half tonne as a maintenance rate, um, three tonne and up to five tonne um, and I, uh, with that five tonne over four years, that's 20 tonne, we started to build carbon then, but that, we had to put that much on to have any impact. Yeah, thank you. Yep, and we, we might actually link to Lisa Warren's report actually, because that's a, a really good one as well. And I'm sure people will be interested in that. We might just go now to the um, getting our producers to just give us some insights into what they took away from the, the groups based on, I guess, their experience with um, workshopping some stuff on fertilizers and, and nutrients. And then we'll come back to um, Mark to finish off with some of those questions you've got in the, the chat box. So can I ask um, Brian Kelly now from the Mid Goulburn, from the Grassland Society, Southern Australian Mid Goulburn site to unmute yourself, um, Brian, and just, um, uh, far away with some of your key insights and then we'll we'll get um, Will to um, also um, present on some of the stuff that he's done with the Kulak group. Oh hi Lisa, uh, apologies I'm a bit rusty with the uh, the technology but um, it's okay. Um, so our group um, we met at Seymour several times obviously um, convened by uh, Lisa and Look, some of the things that we were talking about was obviously mostly to do with um, phosphorus application and particularly doing uh, interpreting of um, soil test results and, and the like. And um, I guess one of the one of the, the key take homes, I suppose, was more soil testing. That was what I think most of our members gained from our group. And particularly in, in my personal circumstance, it meant doing a lot more um, shorter um, soil tests in terms of rather than doing a full soil test, which can be quite expensive, just sticking to the main um, um, NPKS and and, um, and the acidity uh, pH. So therefore, you know, it was encouraging to do more soil tests and actually um, really see where where um, our soils are at um, and. One thing that probably came from that for me was that my phosphorus levels were were reasonably good, but the um, the pH was probably something that was limiting. I noticed on my own property, and also as a result, um, this year I've applied quite a lot more lime to certain paddocks. Um, additionally, on uh, uh, some land which I purchased about six years ago, we did a, a basic um, grazing trial involving. Um, a paddock of approximately 120 acres, which was then subdivided into three paddocks. And I was able to, because quite hilly land where I'm based, 
for pasture grazing. So we're able to do uh, more sort of um, more of a simple rotation grazing and monitoring the um, the change in the, the fertility and the pasture levels. So that's sort of we've completed the three years of that, and I've certainly seen big improvements in um, you know pasture composition and um, pasture cover, particularly in the hill top areas. Um, I'm trying to think what other things we did with our group. But time got away a bit with COVID, etc. Um, so yeah, look, mainly we 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 didn't do much on the alternative fertilizer we're pretty much sticking to the traditional um you know chemical type fertilizers i would call them um but uh yeah that's about that was about the main things that we covered in our group from my recollection oh, that's great brian thank you very much for that that just um i think it's sort of it's sort of reinforcing some of the messages i suppose from um mark about yeah understanding your constraints so being able to do that soil testing and, and finding out what that is, is, is so important. And then being able to make the decision on the most appropriate um, input. And I'm sure Lisa Warren would say that that's always generally comes back to the cheapest <laughs> that you can yes. source. And particularly, as I said, we, in hill country, the distribution of nutrients, especially if you're grazing sheep, the distribution is so, you know, varied across, you know, one paddock. And as I said, I guess the take home was to, rather than just sort of have one hill paddock and pick the mid slope as your, as your, uh, your, your representation, your representative soil, soil test, you, you probably inevitably got to do several so you get a good gauge on, on what's limiting. And if possible, um, if, you know, water and fencing and those things are, can be done, then, then trying to, yeah, just separate your, your hilltops a bit and, and um, basically a bit more land class fencing, so to speak. Yeah, excellent. So I know that Will has to um, disappear pretty soon. So I might just get Will now to provide some of the, um, a bit of a, some of his insights from um, his work with the group. Will, would you like to just um, add to the conversation? Yeah, so <clears throat> similar to, um, to uh, probably the, the outcome for a lot of people was soil testing became pretty apparent that that was going to be a key driver for decision making. Um, and getting the most out of the fertilizer that we are applying and, and probably understanding the, um, the relationship of the, the PBI with Coal P and having a bit of a long-term plan for inputs and, and how that was going to be mapped out with um, over time, over say five years or hopefully a bit less to get to critical values with our P and S. Um, and that was really teased out with, with soil sampling and um, understanding what the parameters of the soils were that you're working with and then um, applying the appropriate amounts with a bit of a long-term view of how you, where you're trying to get to and why. Found that very useful. And we also did some, um, some deep soil samples looking at the, the impact of lime down at sort of 30 centimetres um, and how that affects the longevity of, and effectiveness of lucent, um, which a lot of us around here have quite acidic soils at sort of say 30 centimetres. Um, and so ways to manage that and probably how maybe some farming systems over time in the past have, have affected that acidity. Um, I found that fascinating and, and probably ways that we need to be addressing that or, or managing that in the future to prevent the, the increasing at the pH of soil. Yep. Okay, well, thanks, Will. And um, I suppose both Brian and, and um, Will, did you have any questions that you'd want to ask Mark, I guess, um, on behalf of the group? Um, any unanswered questions that you might have had from working on, on, on the topics that you did? Now you, now's your opportunity to ask Mark before I um, open it up to uh, the rest of the floor for questions. No, I, I feel comfortable uh, myself about uh, what we've covered in, in our coursework with, with Nathan. Um, probably just interesting stuff, which we might have time to address now, is the is relationship of N and um, obviously the, the, the carbon farming is a bit of a hot topic in the industry at the moment and, and, and how we, we've spoken a lot about it in our group, how we can be, I guess, preparing ourselves for that um, that market 
in the future and maybe managing things to have an impact on that now, which seems like a lot of it to do, which is sort of, I was aware of, but possibly expanding on that would be the, the role of nitrogen in sequestering carbon. But that's probably a, a longer, longer explanation than Mark has time for now. But I'm sure there's, there's the work that Mark's doing will be available and we can read up on all of that. But that seems like a really interesting topic for all of us at the moment. Absolutely. And, and Brian, did you have anything um, that you wanted to add to look, that? I suppose one my perhaps take home from Mark's presentation, and it was it was you know fairly technical and more related to cropping, but obviously that that nitrogen is the key driver for, for for yield and production and if you get sufficient nitrogen you're going to get sufficient increase in carbon and i suppose from a from a pasture and grazing point of view um, there's probably not in, in in less intensive farming perhaps there's not as much um, use of urea etc obviously but but i wondered with basic soil test results when you get a soil test, for example, and it shows the, um, I've got some here, but the the total nitrogen, for example, now, however it might be measured, or nitrate, nitrogen in your soil test, is that an indicator at all in a pasture grazing system, whether you've got sufficient nitrogen, or is it is it only really, um, you know, a snapshot in time or not as available to the plant? Like, how, how valuable is the nitrogen result on your soil test? in terms of where, you, where, you, where you're at with nitrogen? So, <clears throat> so I suppose it will, that will depend very much on what that is, on what has actually been measured there. So if it's nitrate, then yes, we'd expect probably the roots can find it. That's available to plants immediately. It's also quite vulnerable to leaching um, during rainfall events, but it's a dynamic pool that is filled very quickly. The thing you'd want to be watching to keep an eye on over time as to whether or not it was being run down, and, th and that's where those balance measurements came from, for instance, with the with Rob Norton's work that I showed in, in grains, is the total nitrogen. So the total nitrogen, the vast majority of that, probably about 99% of it, isn't available to plants there and then. But think of it as, as, you, as you lump some in your super and you're living off the interest, but if you keep taking, and you can, you know, you can, you can dip into it for a bit, but eventually you'll have a problem if you've gone too far. So it needs, needs to be managed in a little bit that way, and it will depend on what the soil test has told you. For a deep end, for a classic deep end test in, in cropping systems that you'd ask for, it would just be a stock of N in kilo, of nitrate N in kilos per hectare down to say a metre, or 60 centimetres, whatever the agronomist has done the testing. And um, all of that is available and likely to be available within that cropping, within that, that season, that growth season, not just cropping. Um, but it's not really telling you the whole longer term picture. And although it's something you should be keeping an eye on, maybe once every two or three years, having, having a total end, requesting a total end and just keeping an eye on whether or not they're going down, they're staying static or going up, gives you a longer term idea as to where the effects of that principle is going because that's where most of it is coming from even in applied fertilizer even if you've applied fertilizer and certainly by legumes it goes into that pool first then comes back out as nitrate that's available to plants so that's sort of the central thing and what you're seeing in the nitrate and what plants can see is just this tiny little bit that falls off the edge but if this great ball of it slowly is decreasing in size over time, the ability of that to supply that nitrate is also going to decrease. Okay, well, thank no, that's you. Good. No, as I said, I've never really taken a, a lot of, um, you know, I never really referred closely to the nitrogen value in my soil tests, I suppose, because I've always considered it was a bit, um, you know, a, um, you know, it can leach or it can be volatile or it can be not necessarily used by the plants, but I was just curious to know, yeah, how how yeah, accurate I, that can be. I mean, that, so that, that nitrates and, and ammonia, and I see um, Doris has mentioned in the chat as well, ammonium um, and indeed some organic nitrogen, all of that is available, theoretically available to you growing to the, to the pasture. It is mostly, particularly nitrate, um, also the most vulnerable 
to Walt. So I suppose where where I'm where I'm trying to emphasize here is you you you've got to think about that pool as, as quite a transient thing that will be refilled, which you're you're backfilling to some extent with fertilizer and indeed legumes are putting more back into it. But it's all governed by the organic matter nitrogen pool, the total nitrogen pool, which is like I say, about 99% of the total nitrogen in a soil that isn't directly available, but is what provides most of the N that's available. And in and going to another system entirely of, of only minimal relevance to this audience, cotton, we sometimes see up, upwards of 90% in cotton of the N in a given crop coming from the organic matter. We don't see the losses of nitrogen either. The nitrogen is going into the organic matter and comes out in the following seasons um, from fertilizer. But the centrality of organic matter to providing nitrogen and indeed phosphorus um, for plant growth um, is really important. Good, thanks, Matt. Um, take questions from the floor. And obviously we've got, I guess, um, all those questions in the chat box and we will be looking to um, answer all of those questions. Um, Michelle, is there a common theme there that you think that might be of value to ask Mark? And I, I, I do notice that Felicity's got a hand up and um, I know it's exhausting to have your hand up. So we might even have to go to Felicity. Just yeah, no, wondering, is there any planned future work to look research um, to look into pasture systems using um, legume and grass wards instead of just looking at the grain system? Um, I can't really speak too much to, to um, funding in that space. Um, MLA is a funding body I've only been peripherally involved with, and it's not our main focus at our lab in, in South Australia, um, for fairly obvious reasons. I would, I would say that the, certainly there is, there is certainly a research need for it to happen. Um, I suspect colleagues either at Vic DPI or, um, Melbourne and Latrobe are probably better placed um, on your patch than myself to answer exactly where the research politics lie at present in that space. Okay, thank you. And uh, Michelle, um, any other common questions or will we head to Felicity? Did we answer your question, Felicity? If you could unmute. Yes, no, that's fine. Thank you. I just, I just, um, I guess it's probably that going forward particularly with MLA's statements and things around carbon neutrality and things like that I think it's some work that potentially needs to be done because obviously and that probably alludes to why my hand was up as well Lisa um, you know all the carbon calculators that are coming through at the moment um, nitrogen is included and the, and the, um, the nitrogen that comes your, your carbon dioxide emissions uh, related to that nitrogen are included in those calculators so I guess, and this was probably for, for Will, who's I think is now left, but one of the key things that I guess we do on our farm as part of our grazing system is if we are applying nitrogen, keeping in mind that it is um, emitting quite a bit of carbon to, to utilise it or to, to produce it, um, is to make sure that the nitrogen is being used to produce feed that's increasing weight, weight gain to try and offset that. So just something going forward, and I think something that probably needs to be done is you know, you apply extra nitrogen to get that balance in the system and to, to try and build carbon, but it's costing you carbon to apply it, just making sure that you're maximising your return from that application, if that makes sense. Uh, that's a really, really good point, Felicity. Um, and, and I'd say your, sis your systems where you have, um, in, in past systems where obviously you have a legume component that is far more integral quite often than cropping systems is where I think some bigger gains can be made there without the um, without the big um, fossil carbon impact of, of um, production of urea. And there was another, and just another, another thing that I did want to touch on that I realised I, I might have generalised too far on um, with the talk of soil testing. And um, even, you know, strategies like James, James's nitrogen bank um, approach um, and other, other other recommendations to be a bit more profligate with your nitrogen. Um, they're not, they're not um, indiscriminate. Um, certainly the end bank strategy is very much based on annual testing for end 
and you're targeting basically in the grains context there what your theoretical best notion best um crop could be in a year and therefore what your top end demand would be with the presumption in drier areas that most of it is not lost and we have evidence that shows that isn't too far away from the truth in drier areas and therefore you capture it in the following years testing so in year one when you instigate this say you need to apply 100 kilos but actually it was a really rubbish year and you only use 50 of it in the plant next year you'd only need to apply 50 ish if that makes sense so you so it is a over time it is a self-balancing exercise and I, I i wouldn't be a soil scientist without advocating for um, greater soil testing to understand trajectories of various um, various constraining properties well yeah well I, I might have to bring that to a um, session to a close but thanks very much mark it's been really enlightening and i'm sure we're all um now sort of starting to i guess some um, Get our heads around so, so much of that information and and obviously you've you've really highlighted i think a bit of a gap that we have in terms of the of us all understanding the nitrogen contribution to our to our systems and we, we i think in the past we've just hoped that it was there that our legumes were providing enough or maybe adding on a little bit more nitrogen fertilizer but we obviously need to get our heads much greater around all that that nitrogen balance in our systems okay. So and really I, I'll, I'll emphasise they may they may well be, um, but it is it was taken for granted for a long time in cropping, and it's coming home to roost. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank thanks, Mark, and we'll.